Welcome to the MAM Journals. Today I'm going to be talking about the Suzuki 800DE. It's a new bike and it was uh, launched in the UK in Birmingham at the end of last year. For this year it's running parallel with the 650 version, a bike I've actually got. The 650 launched in 2004, sold well but was never in fairness the star of either the motorcycle showroom or a motorcycle cafe when you stop for that important break of uh, for coffee. But it was and remains a very flexible, versatile and reliable bike. It's proved popular over the years and one of the reasons I bought them is because of its underrated capability. Now this bike has its more purposeful off-road and whilst I know people have ridden the 650 on gentle gravel tracks, I, it was never really a bike that you could take seriously off-road. This bike has more credentials in that area which we'll explore later. I think this is an important bike for Suzuki and what I'd like to do to help you get a feel for it is talk you through the technical specifications, we'll do a technical walk round, we'll talk about the engine, we'll talk about the chassis and the dimensions of the bike, uh, we'll talk about the technology because it has got some additional technology as the as the bikes evolved and we'll also I'll just have a brief section on aesthetics and general finish and appearance after that I'll take you on a GoPro ride and then we'll be coming back here and I'll be coming to some sort of conclusion obviously during the course of the video I will be making some comparison comments to my XT650 um, but it's not intended to be a direct comparison and um, detailed review in that regard. As always, I hope that you enjoy the video. Let's, as I often do, start with the engine. It's the new Suzuki Parallel Twin. It's liquid cooled, it's got eight valves, and it produces 83 brake horsepower. That's slightly more than the road going version of this, but I'm guessing that's down to the, the, the tune of, of the bike. Perhaps more impressively, it produces 78 newton meters of torque, which compared to the 650 that it's in the process of replacing, um, that's a 25% increase. And that's something which I'll come back to when I talk about riding the bike. In terms of dimensions and sort of chassis, it, it altogether feels a much bigger bike than my 650 XT. I better turn that into measurements rather than subjective views. The seat height on the conventional bike this uh, is 855 millimeters or if you think in inches 33.7. This bike is actually fitted with a lower seat which is 20 millimeters lower which would take it to 835 which in theory is the same as my XT 650. It doesn't feel like it if I'm honest um, but height and foot clearance and contact is not just about the height of the seat it's also about the width of the seat and the position which your leg comes down so it, it does feel a bigger bike and when I rode it I, was, I thought this is quite wide I don't normally give measurements on how wide a bike is but I've decided to do this on this because it's something that struck me um, it's 970 five millimeters wide and that's 38.4 inches if you again if you think of those and in terms of ground clearance it's got 220 millimeters of ground clearance or again if you think in inches 8.7 so again those numbers are bigger than its predecessor the bike weighs 230 kilograms or again, for those that think in pounds, 507 pounds. It's got a, like its predecessor, the XT, it's got a 20 litre tank, although um, Craig at King's has tested and proved extensively that it can actually run on fumes. That's a bit of an in-joke. Um, the bike is fitted with a 21 inch wheel, um, again to assist its off-road capabilities and it's fitted with a 17 at the back. Both of those are tubed. In terms of rear suspension, it's got some a link type coil spring oil damped unit in there. And at the front, it's got inverted coil springs oil damped forks. 
The bike is fitted with twin discs at the front and a single disc at the rear. Right, let's talk about the technology on the bike. And a um, nice place to start might be this new 5-inch TFT screen, which I found both really clear to, to read and was particularly good in sunlight, which is one of its benefits. And uh, they have improved the level of technology on the bike, which I think is a good thing. And it's nice to see technology sort of sweeping down into the less expensive bikes. These aren't cheap bikes by any shape of the, of the mean, but some of the technology on this bike used to be the domain of really quite expensive bikes, and it's good to see it. In terms of what it can do, it's got traction control like the predecessor, but you can if I just press the mode button there. You can see that it's, it's um, set in three, not that I used it in three, in fairness. And then you can just cursor up. You can have two, one, or indeed off. I mostly ran it in either off or one just to get a feel for the bike. You press the button again, and this is new. You've got power modes. Oh, I think you, I think it's new. I can't remember changing the power modes on my other one. And this has got three modes. It's got C, which is the uh, inclement conditions would probably be softest power delivery. You still get the power, but you get it later, in a, and it's delivered more calmly. Um, you then go to B, which is a middle course, and then the one that I rode it in most of the time, uh, the A mode, letting you have full access to the power as quickly as it can safely do so. The, um, the next mode is ABS is not new to the bike. The previous model has ABS, but one thing you couldn't do with it was switch it off and you had no real control of it. Now, you may say on the road, well, why would I want to switch off ABS? And I do sort of respect that. But if you're going to use a bike genuinely off-road in some of the more difficult conditions, the ability just to turn it off is helpful and you can do that and you'll get a warning sign telling you reminding you as you ride it that you've got it off so if you then came back off some gravel roads or some off-roading then back on the road it reminds you you've actually got it but then you can you have to do this one more slowly than the other um, you've got one which is light interference gravel tracks maybe something like that and then you've got what most people would possibly want to use for road use you've got the full level of ABS support I like the other um, instrumentation on the bike. It's easy to, to run, as in down here, you've got two trips. Uh, it tells you that uh, in, in that trip, I've, I've done 59.3 miles per gallon, and I suspect others could do better than that if, if it was a concern to them, but I've been obviously riding it with a little bit of enthusiasm without going completely crazy. And overall, 60.4 uh, and you've got a range this is pretty full so it's about 200 miles for the range of the of the 20 litre tank other technology that's been fitted to the bike and, and i think perhaps one of the most impressive things to make appearance on a bike of of in this price range and um, style is the quick shifter now i particularly like suzuki quick shifters they're um, and I am going to spend a bit of time when we get on the road explaining both how, how it can be used and what the real benefits of it are. Because I've been quite surprised by how many people I've spoken to have, I normally have a conversation with, I say, well, I like, I like, I like the quick shifter on the bike when they ask me what I think of it. And they say, oh, I don't like quick shifters. I then ask them, which system did you try? And they said, oh, I've never tried it. I just don't like it. And I sort of understand that natural reticence if you're very if you're more used to more traditional gearboxes but i'm going to try and demonstrate later how easy these are to use and the benefits it brings because to my mind that is one of the best new bits of technology they put on this bike aesthetics um well it's interesting i i, I ride to a number of sort of cafes in my test runs uh, and i i deliberately park it somewhere where, where people can come along and have a look because i'm interested to see people's reactions and and uh they often chat to them about what their views are uh, i don't it, it wasn't creating a huge amount of interest and and personally i think these types of bikes these adventure style bikes are not 
likely to win many beauty parades if such things still exist. But I, I think it's okay in terms of, of, of what it looks like. And for me, bikes like this are actually more about function and form, and often their design is, is driven by the characteristics that they're putting into the bike in order to make it fit for purpose. And for example, these shrouds are a signal of intent. They don't, you, you don't have them on the XT, and they're designed to protect your front forks from chipping and damage from gravel if you're doing gravel roadies. The 21 inch wheel is again another sure sign that they want this bike to be capable of being run um, more off road and more vigorously than its predecessor. The engine cover mounts here. Um, this is a bit more substantial than the than the previous sort of shroud and I'm pretty sure you'll be able to get metal covers for serious bash plates going underneath to protect the bike from uh, rocks as you do it and the sheer scale of the bike tells you that it it is designed to I say be be used off-road more vigorously than its predecessor As I mentioned in my technical walk around, one of the best new features on this bike is the Suzuki quick shift system. Normally the preserve of much more expensive and powerful bikes, it is great to see this increasingly sophisticated technology cascade into more affordable bikes. Riding as many bikes as I do, I am familiar with these systems which vary in their effectiveness and use them extensively. I particularly like the Suzuki system. Talking to fellow motorcyclists, I am surprised by how many have not yet experienced them and thought it would be useful to demonstrate just how flexible and easy to use they are. Here I'm, I am maintaining a constant speed whilst changing up and down the gearbox and there is no discernible clunk or jerk as I do so. I am neither operating the clutch nor adjusting the throttle position. The system, with a simple tap on the gear lever, is doing all that for me. In the rest of this footage, if you notice carefully, I am rarely using the clutch other than the final change to first as I come to a halt. You can of course mix and match your approach using the clutch and throttle when it suits you. Pressing on this system is of course quicker than you can achieve manually, hence the name, but some modern systems make easy going riding even more relaxed. Here I am using the quick shifter as I exit a roundabout in low gear, still at a slight lean when I go for third. It is effortlessly smooth. On this second roundabout exit, I am quick shifting up the box in higher gears. The engine and gearbox characteristics are perfectly usable whatever approach you prefer. This bike is equally at home on dual carriageways and bigger roads and actually feels more stable than my 650 on the odd occasion I pressed on a little despite the bigger 21 inch front wheel which in earlier bikes sacrificed higher speed stability for off-road capability. They've clearly worked their way through this, although the bike obviously doesn't turn quite as quickly as a smaller wheeled bike. Physics still applies. With a short screen and upright stance, you do get a fair amount of wind noise, but you do not get buffeting. I was impressed with the suspension on this bike, although I'm not always a fan of the OE Dunlops fitted to some bikes, the Dunlops fitted to this bike seem to suit it well. I often ride this badly damaged domed road to get a feel for how the suspension copes. Not surprisingly, a bike designed to have an element of off-road capability coped with such trifles effortlessly. I have actually pogoed along this road on much more sophisticated bikes with road suspension. The suspension on this new 800 is significantly more adjustable than the previous model. 
the old 650 is much less comfortable off-road than bikes like the Yamaha Tenere and I would be interested to see how the new 800 compares to that when the regular off-road journalists put it through its paces. It is clearly Suzuki's intent to improve in that area and the fact they've done so without impairing its road-going capability, indeed they have improved it, is a credit to them. Riding in traffic is easy. This is Abingdon, once the biggest town in the area. In the Norman period it was actually far more important than Oxford, which was considered a small outpost. Physically big, once you get it moving it's surprisingly easy to ride at slow speeds and I quickly got confident of the dimensions to manoeuvre through traffic. A larger wheel can sometimes make slow speeds less precise but I certainly did not get that feeling from this bike. The larger dimensions of the bike, physically it, it feels more like a 1050 to sit on than the 650, did make it more difficult to get on, particularly when parked on an adverse camber, despite the low seat. But at 5 foot 8 inches, 1.72 metres if you prefer, I am less than average height. Knowing how popular the 650 is with those that need a step ladder to get on a KTM, I suspect someone will come out with a low, low seat pretty quickly. I really enjoyed riding this bike, so much so that I actually did 50 or 60 miles more than I really needed to make this review. I particularly enjoyed riding it on roads like these. This is the A417 between Lechlade and Farringdon. It is a road I used regularly in my youth when I was, like most young men in their early 20s, immortal and in my rose-tinted memories the road was race circuit smooth. Nowadays, having already sampled hospital food and decided I don't like it and concluded that present food is unlikely to be any better, I am far more restrained. Even at these more modest speeds, the bike is fun and engaging to ride. Sure-footed and responsive. The long-term reliability of this new engine, a great virtue in the existing 650, is of course yet to be proved, but I have no reason to believe that it won't be. I do hope that in a few years it will be considered by that you can take on a grand adventure, as well as what it has already proved to be, in the short term I've had it, a bike you can ride for the sheer joy of doing so. So what are my initial conclusions? I know the question you're all dying to ask me is, well, is it better than your 650 XT? And the answer is, of course it is. After 20 years of development, I'd be disappointed and frankly amazed if they couldn't use all the knowledge they've acquired during that period to build an improved and more sophisticated bike. It's a great engine. It's a fantastic gearbox. I like the firmer suspension and it rides really well. Is it £1,500 better? Well, I'll let you decide that. But I certainly, will I be replacing my XT immediately? Uh, no, I won't. I'm happy with it. It's a good bike. I've always thought they've been underrated and they're very capable. Uh, but when that bike comes to change, would I change it for one of these? Well, I'd be certainly delighted to ride one as long as I can work out how I'm going to get on it. I do hope that you've enjoyed the video and that you found it useful. If you did, you might like to press the like button or even consider subscribing. But as I repeatedly say, uh, I'm very relaxed about that. Most of all, I want you to ride safe and stay well.